you go to Google and type in the word experiment, one of the first things you'll see is the Stanford Prison Experiment. It's probably the best known psychological study of all time. It all began in West Coast America on a summer's day back in 1971, when college students grew their hair long, protested against their government, were pro-peace and totally anti-authority. Or so we thought, until Philip Zimbardo. So the Stanford Prison Study very simply is an attempt to see what happens when you put really good people in a bad place. We put an ad in the city newspaper, wanted students for study of prison life, lasting up to two weeks. We're going to pay you $15 a day. This is back in 1971. It's pretty good money. And we picked 75 volunteers, gave them a battery of psychological tests, and we picked two dozen who on all dimensions were normal and healthy to begin with. And then we did what is critical for all research. We randomly assigned half of them to the role of playing guards or the role of playing prisoners. It's a, literally like flipping a coin. And then what we did is we told the guards come down a day early and we had them pick their own uniform. We had them help set up the prison so they'd feel like it was their pl prison and the, and the prisoners were coming into their place. The prisoners, we simply said, wait at home or in the dormitories. Well, what we didn't tell them, which is a little bit of the deception of o omission, is that they were arrested by the city police. Right there, they, you know, they took me out the door, they put my hands against the um, car. It was a real cop car, it was a real policeman. They took me to the, to the police station, the basement of the police station. Uh, I had told the policeman to put a blindfold on the prisoners, but since they had never been arrested, they didn't know that doesn't happen. The reason for the blindfold is then my assistants would come, put them in our car, bring them down to our prison, and they'd be in our prison now, blindfolded. The guards would strip them naked, uh, delouse them, pretending that they were lice. It's kind of a degradation ritual. And after the first day, I was about to end it because nothing was happening. But the next day, on the morning of the next day, the prisoners rebelled. And what the guards did, they came to me and said, the prison's rebelling, what are we going to do? I said, it's your prison. Whatever you want, I will do it, but you've got to tell me. And they said, we have to treat force with force. So they broke down the doors. Stripped the prisoners naked, dragged them out. Some of them, they tied up their feet. They put them in solitary confinement, which was a tiny little hole uh, in a closet, uh, uh, about, about this big, uh, dark, uh, and, and they said, at this point, everything but breathing air is a privilege. Food is a privilege, clothes are a privilege, having a bed is a privilege. And so the guards began to say, here are the new rules. And the new rules are, you are dangerous and we are going to treat you as such. And then it began to escalate. Each day, the level of um, abuse, aggression, violence against prisoners got more and more extreme. And so the guards changed to become more dominant. And you see, it's all about power. It's the whole institution that, that empowers the guards, who are the representative of this institution called prison, to do whatever is necessary to prevent prisoners from escaping, maintain law and order. Keep going. Once I was blind, but now Once I see. I was the way the direction it took is having them engage in ever more humiliating tasks, cleaning toilet bowls out with their bare hands, taking their blankets and putting them in dirt and ne with nettles, and the prison had to spend hours taking the nettles out if they wanted to, you know, sleep. And it's essentially saying, we have the power to create a totally arbitrary, mindless environment, and that's the environment you have to live in. So some of the prisoners are now crushed. And in 36 hours, the first kid has an emotional breakdown, meaning crying, screaming, irrational thinking. I gotta go. I to a doctor, anything. No, no, no! No, no, no! God damn it! And we have to release him. In five days, we had to release five of the prisoners because the situation was so overwhelming. What about the kids who didn't, who didn't break down? They became zombies. Zombies in the sense that they became almost all mindlessly obedient. Whatever the guards would say, they did. Do this, they did. Do 10 push-ups, do 20 push-ups. Step on him while he's doing a push-up. Uh, tell him he's a bastard. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. It was, it was horrifying to see the kids break down. It was even more horrifying to see 
these other, these other kids just become mindlessly obedient. What prisoner 819 did, my cell is a mess. Because of what prisoner 819 did, my cell is a mess. Again, we have to keep remembering, these are kids who start out being rebels against society, all, every one of them, and now they are just pawns. They are, they are, they are the puppets that, that the guards are uh, manipulating. In fact, one of the guards uh, said uh, it was like being a puppeteer. The guards tested their control over the prisoners by making them write a letter home. No need to visit its seventh habit. Yours truly. Yours Your truly. Your loving son. Your loving son. And put the name there that your mother gave you. The results were surprising because we, I did not expect the transformation of good kids into pathological prisoners or abusing guards to occur so quickly and so extremely. That is, we had assumed from all other research, you know, that there would be verbal abuse, they would make fun of them, there would be teasing, there would be bullying, but not this kind of, I would call it creative evil. That is, thinking about ways to demean, degrade, dehumanize other human beings. And the critical thing there in that transformation is becoming the role, or the role becoming you, and, and suspending your usual morality, your usual way of thinking. You really become that person. Once you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you, put on, you take the nightstick, and you, know, you, you act the part. So what Zimbardo's research demonstrates so dramatically is that situations can affect us more than we think, and can often outweigh individual characteristics. So if we're going to use psychology to try to reduce the possibility for evil, maybe we need to focus more on systems and less on individuals. But should the research ever have been done? After all, the participants suffered real harm. In hindsight, again, I have mixed feelings about the study. Should it have been done? Well, not if it means suffering of anybody. Would I like my son to have been in that study? No. On the other hand, does it tell us something vital about human nature that has enduring value. There I have to say yes. It's been used in lots of prisons. It's a training device to get people to be sensitized to how easy it is to abuse power. Uh, so in that sense, it has, it has widespread enduring value. Therefore, I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm glad I did it.